Now, it's also possible that from time to time, the value of an investment might have actually gone down. And if that's the case, we still have to do the adjustment, but the journal entry would look a little bit different. So if you look at this alternate version, once again, we have a $10,000 investment in Apple. But in this version, let's say that at the end of the year, it was actually worth only $9,000. Well, that actually means that our investment has gone down in value. So it's actually gone down by 1000 So again, I have to do the adjustment. But this time, notice how it's different. I will debit unrealized loss and credit fair value adjustment. Now remember I said earlier, losses are always a debit, gains are always a credit. So that's how I know that that loss has to go on the debit side. And if you go back and look at the previous entry, notice fair value adjustment. There it's a debit and there it's a credit. That account title goes either as a debit or a credit depending on where I need it to be. But in this case, since this is a loss, I need this to be on the credit side. So that gives you two different examples of the two different possibilities. You could either be making a gain adjustment or potentially a loss adjustment. Now moving beyond the less than 20% category, what if we ever buy stock and we actually end up owning 20 to 50%? If that's the case, I would actually account for this in a slightly different way because a 20 to 50% ownership represents a significant influence over the company. So in this example, we're going to invest $5 million in a company called Smith Company. This represents a 30% ownership of that company. Well, that puts us right there in that 20 to 50% level. So that puts us in the category of significant influence. So that's going to be accounted for in a slightly different way. So I will debit long-term investment, Smith, $5 million and credit cash. And notice I don't put AFS or trading. And that's because with significant influence, it's neither one. It is just simply a long-term investment in that company. Now, this journal entry is very interesting. We're going to receive $100,000 in dividends from this investment. Now, we did a journal entry like this earlier, but this time it's a little different. Notice that I'm debiting cash, $100,000. I also have a credit for $100,000. But notice this. I'm not crediting dividend revenue. Instead, I'm crediting long-term investment in Smith. So that's a little different than the way we recorded that previously. The reason that I do that is because when I own 20 to 50 percent in a company, I own such a significant amount of that company that it's almost as if I'm a part of that company. So when I pay out a dividend, even though I receive the money, it's almost as if I'm paying for part of that. So that's why it lowers the value of my investment. So that's a journal entry on dividends where the journal entry changes and literally only because we owned a slightly different percentage of ownership. So that's why it's so important that we take a good close look at all of our transactions and always think about what percentage do we own in that company. Here's another unusual transaction. The Smith Company has reported a $250,000 net income. Why is that interesting? Well, I'm not Smith Company. I just own a part of Smith Company. But if I'm in that 20 to 50% territory, again, I own such a high percentage that it's almost as if I am a part of that company. So when they report a net income, I have to report my percentage of that net income. So since I own 30% of this company, 30% of $250,000 is $75,000. So I will debit my long-term investment because it's now worth more, and I will credit revenue from the investment. So that's a transaction 
that is only required if you own 20 to 50 percent of the stock. Now at this point we've actually decided to sell the investment in Smith Company and we're going to sell that investment for six million dollars. So I can debit cash for six million. I also have to remove the investment from the books and I can do that by crediting long-term investment Smith. Now where does this number come from? Four million nine hundred and seventy five thousand. Well to see that you have to go back and look at the previous entries. In this case when I first invested in Smith my initial investment was worth five million but then I received that dividend and that lowered the value of that by a hundred thousand so it took it down from five million down to four point nine then I reported that net income and that raised the value of the investment by seventy five thousand so that's why at the current point the value of that investment is actually four million nine hundred and seventy five thousand so to get that number I've got to go back and look at my previous entries. And then of course the difference here of $1,025,000 is a gain on the sale of the investment. Now anytime I own more than 50%, that puts me into this final category. Anything more than 50% ownership represents a controlling influence. And why is that? Well remember, to control a company I can control that company as long as I own as little as 51% of the stock. 51% gives me the controlling influence. So as a result, the two companies are now going to be one company. So what used to be two separate companies with two separate sets of financial statements, now the financial statements actually must be consolidated into one. So I don't actually do any journal entries for this investment. Instead, I have to do something that's far more complicated, and that is blend the two companies together completely so that they actually become a single entity.